Okay, it's good to see you all here tonight. Um, we're on the third of our lecture series of four. Uh, tonight we're uh, very lucky to be joined by Rachel Serge. Now, Rachel is an independent historian whose research looked primarily at the role of dress, social and leisure history played um, the lives of the Northern Irish and Irish women in the early uh, to mid 20th century, with particular interest in the lives and roles of uh, Northern Irish Irish women during World War II or Second World War, as they always shout at me when I'm saying this here. Um, Rachel has previously worked uh, for the National Trust for Scotland, the Imperial War Museum, not jealous at all, uh, Marks and Spencer Archive and HMS Caroline. And Rachel is currently researching the role of uh, women's Royal Naval Services and the Women's Land Army in Northern Ireland, as well as the role of flappers and modern guard in post-partition Ireland. So tonight she's talking to us on uh, Join the Rains and Free a Man for the Fleet Recruitment and Training and the role of the Women's Royal Naval Service in wartime Northern Ireland, Rachel. Good evening and thank you to the Northern Ireland War Memorial for inviting me to speak about the Women's Royal Naval Service or RENS in Northern Ireland in World War II. I will say that I am not a naval historian, but a dress and social historian of 20th century Northern Irish, Irish, British women from across the island of Ireland and further afield. I have had a lifelong fascination with anything to do with women, dress, social, as history from 1900 to 1970, as I was reared by my grandmother, great grandmother, great aunts, and I've always had a fascination about their lives during this time, particularly the period of 1939 to 1945 when they were young women, and I grew up with stories of them with the red lipstick and the curled hair, and I love vintage fashion, and I'm an independent historian and. I like to um, sometimes include stories from my family archive, but unfortunately they were not in any of the British Armed Services, so I'll be able to share those tonight. Women from Northern Ireland who joined the British Armed Services to serve at home or abroad or were stationed here in either the Rens, Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the, w the WAP, Auxiliary Tutorial Service, the ATS, and various nursing services, as well as civilian organisations as the Women Women's Voluntary Service, the WBS, and the Women's Land Army, woman, the WLA. A little known fact that there was actually a woman's land army here during the war, but that's another story for another time, are often overlooked in the broader narrative of the role of women during World War II. It is easier for me to find a plethora of information on American women and even women in Nazi Germany than it is to find information on Northern Irish, Irish women in World War II. Nevertheless, this is notwithstanding the excellent recent scholarship that has emerged in the last 10 20 to 20 years, which redresses this problem with an array of academic articles, blog posts, books, magazine articles, exhibitions, oral history projects, etc., now available for the scholar of 20th century Irish, Northern Irish women. This talk will cover the formation of the Wrens in World War I, the reformation of the Wrens prior to the outbreak of war in 1939, and the role of the Wrens in Belfast and further afield between 1939 and 1945, and a brief mention of the Wrens in the post-war world. At the start of World War I in 1914, the role of women was still firmly within the home and not on the front, the front helping or aiding the men. This is despite the advances in the later Victorian and Edwardian era in women's education and rights, for example, the Married Woman Property Acts of the 1880s and the ongoing campaign for votes for women. As the war progressed, it became increasingly clear that women were not only needed to free men for the front, but also to aid the British armed services and troops both in Europe and at home. With the formation of nursing services, civilian corps such as the Women's Legion and the Women's Land Army, it is inevitable that the Army, Navy and eventually the fledgling Air Service required women to join the auxiliary forces. In 1917, Dean Catherine Fersh was asked by the Admiralty to form a naval organisation for women that would eventually be called the Women's Royal Naval Service, or RENS. Their uniform in World War I, as we can see here, demonstrated by a ratings outfit um, from the Rens or UK organisation and Edith Bevan. Unfortunately, I was unable to find out where she served, but it's a good example of a ratings uniform from World War I. It consisted of a dressing gown style coat, blouse and skirt, white pudding bowl or navy pudding bowl cap with navy ribbon with name of the ship imprinted on it, black stockings and black Oxford style shoes. 
By 1918, the service had over 5,000 members, and these women worked in a variety of roles, including typists, clerks, cooks, messengers, etc. And towards the end of the, the war, they were even working on ships, like this friend to the, to the left, who was working in ships, I think, in Portsmouth or Southampton. And we also here have an example of the Wrens and Women's uh, Auxiliary Army Corps at recruitment post from World War One. However, like other auxiliary forces, the Wrens did not survive the First World War completely unscathed, and some members of the Wrens died in active service. The first Wren to die in active service was Cork born Mary Josephine Carr, known as Josephine, who died in Borden, who died on board the RMS Leinster on the 10th of October 1918, just a month before the end of hostilities in November 1918. Josephine was on her way to serve at her home naval base of Cork. Unfortunately, she died on her way home. Her family home is still visible on Google Maps in Cork, if anybody is interested. Her family are still um, living and working in Cork. It's also worthwhile noting that the Wrens in World War I also served in Bunkrana, County Donegal, Belfast, Lorne, and possibly Dublin, counties Mayo and Argalway, but I have not been able to find any evidence of Wrens serving in these latter parts. Wrens in World War I were were trained in semaphore signaling, and this is a photograph of them in the very early stages of the Wrens when they're still wearing a combination of their civilian clothing and Wrens officers' uniform. And this is where they're spe learning spacing on parade with a very dull looking board sergeant, possibly from the army, who didn't think women could space out on parade like men. Mm -hmm. After the end of World War One, the Wrens were disbanded, and it would be nearly two decades before. They reformed in 1938 with the shadow of war looming once more. It's, it's worth noting now by 1938, Ireland was now in post partition Ireland, and they would, if the Wrens were re established, they would not have a base in Cork or Donegal. I have found it incredibly difficult to find any evidence of women serving in Bonkrana and Cork in World War One, with only two mentions in the London Dairy Sentinel and the Lauren Times of. Um, Wrens serving in both Derry, Larne and um, Bunkrana prior to the end of hostilities in November 1918. Um, and it was, a, it was a bit of time before they were reformed in Northern Ireland in 1938, but I will now speak about the reformation of the Wrens on the English mainland in 1938. The reformation of the Wrens and the eventuality of another war was being sought by members of various ex-Wrens associations, including former director, Dame Catherine I as early as the autumn of 1937. Hannah Roberts writing in the Wrens in wartime, the Women's Royal Naval Service 1917 to 1948, notes that a retired male civil servant, C.M. Bruce, was appointed in 1938 to oversee the reformation of a Women's Auxiliary Naval Corps. As quote, Bruce's notes suggest that the reason the scheme was written by men was because no suitable woman had been appointed to head the service at that point. Unquote. So there was many capable women like Dame Catherine first, who was the director of the Wrens in World War I, and she was more than willing to give her help to the reformation of the Wrens in the late 1930s. This is despite the evidence that Dame Catherine first, in the autumn of 1937 and spring of 1938, wrote to the Admiralty offering the help of ex Wrens. Many other former Wrens also wrote to offer their services should the need arise. Further, first writings and patients. And patients felt that, quote, there is first class material and it would be wasteful to lose it if there is even a remote chance of the Navy requiring women for replacements on the shore, unquote. First also wrote without reservation in the Wrens magazine for October 1938 that the Admiralty was wasting valuable energy and women power with the increasing silence to her letters and offers for help. Conversely, unbeknownst to First and other former Wrens, the Wrens were being reformed behind their backs with a formal announcement in November 1938 and recruitment beginning in earnest in early 1939. Hannah Roberts intimates that the reason for the reformation of the Wrens coming after the WAF and the ATS is that people assumed that the Royal Navy would be the dominant service and did not need a woman's auxiliary force like the, the like their Air Force and Army counterparts. Nonetheless, first eventually held some influence with the reformation of the Wrens, with, suggest, with su suggesting Vera Lawton Matthews and Beatrice Wyatt as leading members of the new Wren service. She had also kept all her 1917 to 1919 service papers, notes, diaries, etc., 
and offered these to Bruce when they eventually met. Bruce used these papers in the writing of the new Wren's scheme. Wren's in World War II in Northern Ireland. Join the Wrens and free a man for the fleet, or so the jolly title goes in one of the Wrens recruitment posters from World War II. This poster depicts a plucky, fashionable Wren in her smart naval uniform, curled hair and red lipstick saluting an imaginary officer. This Wren depicts the archetypal World War II poster girl who, with great courage, is serving her country whilst freeing me up men to go abroad. Her in a naval uniform was designed by Parisian-based couture, British couturier Edward Molyneux and was perhaps the most coveted of all the uniforms worn by the various women's services. As part of my work as a dress historian, I, I analyze the lives of 20th century women through the lens of dress, fashion, and costume. In my research for this talk and in ongoing research on the Wrens in Northern Ireland, the uniform was one of the main reasons for joining as it was unanimously agreed that the Wrens uniform was the most fashionable out of all of the women's services. The uniform of the WAF, we can see here on the left, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force and the, the Auxiliary Territorial Service here on the right had belts on their jackets, which did not suit all figures. Whereas the Wren's uniform was more in a style of a, a school blazer or formal a jacket blazer worn for a skirt suit and more flattering amongst female figures. As you can see for context, the differences between the WAF and the ATS's uniform. I will now go on to speak about the ratings uniform and the officer's uniform because they were consistent, they were different. The ratings uniform consisted of a navy wool skirt and blazer, white linen shirt and collars, tie stockings, Oxford broke shoes, wool greatcoats, summer or tropical white linen dresses, white, an white ankle socks, and white Oxford broke shoes for tropical dress, um, black stockings or white stockings, depending if they were tropical, tropical dress or they were serving in colder climes. It is worth noting that prior to 1942, the Wren's ratings hat, which we can see on the left, consisted of a soft, soft felt cap with gold lettering depicting the ship they were attached to. You can see they were, the Wren's rating here practicing semaphore. She's wearing the pre-1942 hat. In 1942, the Wren's ratings hat was changed to be more like the male ratings hat, a hat with a firm brim with gold lettering of the ship they were attached to, which you can see in the Wren's rating on the here to the left. The uniform of the Wren's officers consisted of a wool blazer with brass buttons and blue ribbon on the cuffs to denote rank, wool skirt, black stockings, black Oxford brogue shoes, white shirt and collars, tie, great coat, and a hard brimmed tricorn hat with the emblem of the Wren's to front. One, um, this is an example of the Wren's officer's jacket from the Northern Ireland War Memorial Collection. Unfortunately, we do not know who this belonged to, but from looking at the jacket, it has been tailored to fit the Wren's officer that wore it. And on the left is a, um, it's a dent, it's, I think this may have been from a Wren's uh, training booklet that denoted the denoted the officer and who you could ident identify by stripe. You have second officer, third officer, superintendent, chief Wren, so that they would be able to salute properly depending on their on their rank. Um, one Wren rating, Maureen Lightbody, who was from Bangor and was stationed nearby, describes her ratings uniform, which I'll quote from, which I'll, in an oral history interview from the Northern Ireland War Memorial Collection, which I will quote from soon. And she describes her excitement about getting the uniform and how she was able to um, obtain beautiful clothing, even though there was clothes rationing and a lot of her friends were, were jealous of her beautiful uniform and black silk stockings. Mm -hmm. um, we can see here on the left, it's an example from a Wren's great coat and bell bottoms if they were on um, if they were on shore duty or maintenance duty mainly in England, they would have wore these much to the derailment of officers and other naval ratings that didn't think women should be wearing trousers at any time, even if they were mechanics or cleaning out torpedo sheds. These are from the collection of the Tyne and Weir Museums and the Wren's officer hat is from the collection of the Northern Ireland War Memorial. Maureen Lightbody, who I will quote, was a rating who served near Bangor um, and I will now quote her oral history section where she talks about getting her uniform. Quote, you got two suits, two navy suits, jacket and skirt, and I think you would four white blouses with detached collars. You had to send, send them to the laundry to get them. I sent everything to the laundry. And you got a duffel coat if you were out signalling, 
but I had a lovely navy heavy winter coat, rain coat and a Burberry. And you were very well supplied right down to your brushes and shoe polish, everything and black tights, black shoes, unquote. Women who served in the rains in tropical locations, unfortunately Belfast is not tropical, <laughs> and they were not issued the rains tropical uniform. Most of these women served prior to the fall of Singap Singapore and Hong Kong and maybe further afield in Australia and New Zealand and Bermuda and other parts of the Caribbean. They wore a white linen or cotton version of the range uniform, dependent if they were a rating or an officer. The officer is on the left, the rating is on, sorry, the, off, the rating is on the right. A rating or an officer, both officers and ratings wore a right, white linen or cotton dress. The difference being the officer's dress had epaulets and square shoulders with the rating dress. having rounded shoulders and their rank denoted by a pin on their collar, which you can just about see in this photograph. Initially, the wrens were supposed to wear white stockings, but these proved unpopular and impractical in tropical heat and soon switched to cotton socks. Both ratings and officers wore similar style, wide brimmed hats to reflect the harsh tropical sun. Maureen Nightbody also states that wrens in Northern Ireland were issued with a summer uniform similar to the tropical uniform of wrens worn in Singapore and Hong Kong. Quote, but then you had your hat and in the summertime you'd had a white cap put over the top of your hat summertime, unquote. The uniforms that both the ratings and officers wore enabled the women of the Rens to undertake a variety of roles both at home and abroad. At the start of the war, Rens mainly became typists, messengers, cooks and clerical staff. As the war developed, many Rens went on, on to undertake a wide array of duties, including but not limited to working as part of the decryption staff at Bletchley Park sending and receiving signals, monitoring radar, undertaking courses which enabled them to manoeuvre small boats, manning and flying naval aircraft, mechanical and driving work to name but a few of the varied roles the Wrens undertook throughout the war. It is worthwhile noting that some members of the Wrens with language skills served in the Free French and Special Opera Operations Executive or SOE as operatives in France before liberation in 1944 and in stations across England, Scotland and Wales. The messages decrypted at Bletchley Park that affected the Battle of the Atlantic and were pertinent to the role of the Royal Navy in Northern Ireland were relayed from station to station by Wrens and other staff until they came to Belfast Castle. One of the headquarters of the Royal Navy in Northern Ireland, which also included Customs House Belfast and the HMS Caroline, Maureen Lightbody may have been one of these women when she depicts learning, signal, signalling and Morse code in the Wrens. So went into the signal office and that was every ship that came up the lock and had to be registered. And we had to take the signal and there was a code. We had to let them come up, come in, and I wanted to be a visual signal man. So I had to train for that, but the war was over and I never became qualified. The Orlock had a signal post. You flashed the lights, the Morse code and Grey Point and the Orlock and Helen's Bay was the other one, unquote. Wrens in Northern Ireland were also typists, clerks, messengers, drivers, mechanics, etc., amongst a wide variety of roles. Maureen Lightbody was one of those Wrens who were also trained as typists. Quote, so I typed out what I thought was right and presented them, and it turned out they didn't know either. either. So what I put down was fair war, but I found they were awfully nice. They didn't say you haven't done that right or anything. They just say, oh, is that right? So nice, dear. Unquote. Wrens were also were stationed predominantly in Belfast, London, Derry, Derry, Lauren, Bangor, etc. In Belfast, Wrens who served on board the HMS Caroline, who you can see here being expected by, inspected by the Queen Mother in 1942, uh, worked in a variety of roles, including as maintenance Wrens in charge of the maintenance of the ship and the docks, and others were torpedo Wrens working in the depth charge shop. The Rennery, as their, um, their barracks was known, was located on East Pollock Dock, with Wrens taking a Liberty ship to West Pollock Dock to begin their daily duties. Many Wrens were also there to see the first disembarkation of the first GIs to set foot on British soil in January 1942, when G GIs disembarked from ships at Clarendon Dock. Wrens who served at Belfast Castle, with the Rennery being close by, just off the Antrim Road, worked at the Signals Distribution Office, which was part of the larger Signal Office situated at Belfast Castle. 
Friends who worked at Belfast Castle were on duty on the 5th of June 1944 and remember seeing Belfast Lock so full of ships that you could have walked from one side of the lock to the other on the ships alone. He also remember the next day, 6th of June 1944, D-Day, that the lock was completely empty and they were working on sending and interpreted, interpreting signals dealing with the D-Day landings in Normandy. The Wrens in Northern Ireland were either women from Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland who served in Northern Ireland, or women from England, Wales, Scotland or further afield who were stationed in Northern Ireland. Many Wrens came from naval families with brothers, fathers, male cousins and uncles already serving in the Royal Navy, the Wrens being a natural choice for their wartime service. It is worthwhile noting that there was no male or female conscription in Northern Ireland in World War II. Women were were conscripted into the various services and munitions factories in England, Scotland, and Wales from 1941 onwards, depending on their age and personal circumstances. There is some conjecture, conjecture relating to the Wrens recruits from the Republic of Ireland. Both official and unofficial archival and news resources report that recruits from the Republic of Ireland did travel to Northern Ireland to enlist in the Wrens to either serve in Northern Ireland or further afield. On the other hand, these sources also state that these women were barred from joining in Northern Ireland and had to travel to Scotland, England or Wales to enlist, and to enlist in the Wrens. However, though, through my own research, I have found that many women did enlist in both Northern Ireland and England, Scotland and Wales, with many being posted back to places like the HMS Caroline and Belfast Castle. Official statistics omit if any women did join from the Republic of Ireland, but um, I am unsure as how, to ac how accurate these statistics are. Between 1939 and late 1944, 619 women from Northern Ireland had joined the Wrens, and by, and by the end of the war, there was a further 643 women who had joined, 60 women joining in one, in one month of June 1943. It is unclear where these women came from. Perhaps they did come from the Republic of Ireland and use relatives or friends' addresses to join the Wrens. This is one aspect of my research I would like to delve more deeply into and ascertain how many women from across the island of Ireland joined the Wrens to serve in Northern Ireland or further afield. Many Wrens who were sent to Northern Ireland found the local population easygoing and friendly and refreshing when they were out and about on their duties and in their leisure time. Wrens in Northern Ireland took advantage of the booming social scene in Belfast and further afield of dance halls, cinemas, swimming baths, shopping, and access to the beautiful countryside of Northern, Northern Ireland on their days on leave. Popular excursions included day trips to Port Rush and Newcastle County Town for fish and chips, ice cream and a turn about the amusements. Those who were more active could be able to take advantage of walking and hiking in the morns, the more mountains and the glens of Antrim on their personal time. Many lifelong friendships were formed with fellow Wrens and local people, with many Wrens returning to Northern Ireland for their holidays after the end of the war. When the Americans entered the war in 1942, Wrens and Derry, London Derry, were in popular demand to show American sailors and soldiers the sights and sounds of their, of their new location. And they also attended dances at various American bases across, the, across and nearby the city. Many a love match was made between Wrens and American soldiers, sailors and airmen. One Wren serving at Belfast Castle as a decoder met her future American husband on one hot summer's day when the Wrens went to find ice cream and her future husband bought her and her friends ice cream, he knew that love could be found over in 99. Notwithstanding, Belfast sent her role in Northern Ireland in World War II. As previously mentioned, it is important to remember the role of other places that Wrens did serve in Northern Ireland, particularly with the naval base of Derry, London Derry, as it was the first port of call for many Allied service personnel, particularly during the Battle of the Atlantic. One Wren from Derry, London Derry, was Maeve Boyd, who joined in 1942 and served near to her home. Maeve served as a stores clerk and issued naval uniform to sailors from across the world, including Canadian, Jamaican and American sailors. Maeve, along with other Wrens, may have been present at the surrender of the U-boats at Listen Halley in May 1945, a spectacular sight that many would remember for the rest of their lives. One Wren remembers being present at the U-boats surrender and recall that many local people under the cover of darkness snuck onto the U-boats and helped themselves liberally to tin food, batteries, torches and blankets to bring home to their families. Maeve Boyle reiterated that the Wrens give her chances that her ordinary life did not, including being trained as a typist and a clerk, 
and meeting people from all over the world, widening her and her fellow Wren's horizons that maybe no other experience could have afforded. Many Wren's utilize their skills they learned when in the Wren's and in their post-war career, choices of type as typists, clerks, teachers, academics, and nurses, as their life in the Wren's had given them a taste of what they could accomplish and a yearning for a more independent and free life post-war. Some Wren's were fortunate to stay on after the end of facilities in August 1945, and eventually became part of a permanent Wren service serving either in Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, Hong Kong, Bermuda, Singapore, and other British bases abroad. Some lucky even got permanent postings in tropical places like Australia and New Zealand and India after partition in 1947. Whilst the number of Wren serving in Northern Ireland or from Northern Ireland and serving elsewhere may be small in comparison to those serving in England, Scotland, and Wales and other stations, the role of the Wrens in Northern Ireland within the larger context of the women's auxiliary services cannot be ignored. Often away from home for the first time in their lives, the Riggs Wrens were brave to undergo their initial training before obtaining a posting possibly away from their families. They undertook work at times of great danger, particularly during the Belfast Blitz of 1941, when nearby places nearby Belfast Castle were bombed, and also saw horrors unimaginable to our modern eyes. They socialised with people outside of their social class at a time when there was a strict class divide and broadened their horizons with meeting men and women from across the world, united in fighting the co common evil of fascism. Though my talk has described their lives both both when they were on official service and in their leisure times happy, it is worthwhile noting that many Wrens did experience the horrors of war by losing members of their family, either through the Blitz or active service. One Wren remembers a, a troop ship coming in with many severely injured troops who had lost parts of their um, their limbs, their arms, their legs, ears, eyes, etc. Many died, and 80 years later she was able to recall this with horror. So it's important to know that everything wasn't red lipstick and, and silk stockings at the reality for head home here in Belfast. And it's also important to situate the Wrens in Northern Ireland with their counterparts from Canada, Australia and other parts of what is now the British Commonwealth to show that Wrens just weren't in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. They were ac across what is now the British Commonwealth. By doing this and re-examining the role of women of colour, LGBTQ women and other lost spouses from within the wider spectrum, of serving Wrens and other women who served in British Armed Forces, we can begin to build a better, more complete picture of the very lives of these women who served the country between 1939 and 1945. And I'm going to speak about some of the lesser known women's Royal Naval Service Services from across the world, but starting with my favourite, which is the Women's Royal Indian Naval Service, which is until very recently a very um, under-researched aspect of pre-partition India. Um, there's been a few oral history projects, um, articles, blog posts, and I think a book is coming up about women who serve. Unfortunately, a lot of these women have now passed on, but there is an oral history archive on the Imperial War Museum's website, but it's not digitally accessible, so not accessible to everybody. Um, the Women's Royal Indian Naval Service with two of the officers here, Margaret L. Cooper and Deputy Director of the Women's Royal Indian Naval Service, or RINS, Second Officer Kailani Sen, apologies for any mispronunciation, in Roy South, Scotland in 1945, courtesy of the RENS.org.uk. The RENS was set up in January 1944, though the RENS were somewhat established prior to 1944. It was thought that an Indian specific organisation was needed as the centre of the war move from Europe to Asia. The RINs employed both British and Indian women as ratings and officers. The uniforms were adapted for the specificities of Indian dress and religious practice by including saris and or longer skirts in both the uniforms for the ratings and officers. The mix of dress can be seen in this picture from the National Arm Museum and the Imperial War Museum. This is the Women's Royal New Zealand Naval Service. I'll not try to pronounce the acronym, it's, it's too hard. And um, they were again training with signaling and relieving New Zealand naval men to go abroad. Um, another uh, favorite of mine, I'm their their uniform is quite similar to the British Wrens, was the Women's Royal Australian Naval Service or the RAMS. This was established in April 1941. These women served in various roles, including as tele telephonists, clerks and cooks, etc., but initially weren't able to serve abroad until later in the war, like their Rins and Rens counterparts. 
Their uniform was like that of the wrens, but their hats were either wide brim to protect against the harsh Australian sun or a beret unlike the pudding bowl hat of the junior wrens reading. By 1945, 3,122 Australian women were recruited and serving in the rams in various roles across Australia. And, and we also have the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service with the very fashionable hat that actually became part of popular fashion and were very much sought after. People buying them or stealing them off their sister if they were serving and taking the um, the name of the ship off so they could wear it with their everyday dress. Um, personally, I think it's one of my favourites outside of the British Friends uniform, but you can see the similarities with the great coats, the stockings and the shoes. Just the difference with maybe what they were where they were serving on their coat and on their hats. And probably the, the least well known, the swans, which is unusual because everywhere else is known as the Rams or the Rins. These are the South African Women's Auxiliary Naval Service. To find the information on them is incredibly hard. But there's only one book published in the eighties that regularly goes for over 200 300 pounds on Amazon. It's incredibly hard to find. Um as Unlike their other counterparts, they were known as the Swans, probably possibly because their uniform was was white. They didn't particularly wear the, the heavy wool blazers or the coats unless it was particularly cold in South Africa. They were formed in October 1943. Again, like in Australia, Swans were initially unable to serve abroad, but this changed as the war progressed. They had a uniform like the Wren's tropical uniform. The more than often they were wearing this white cotton dress as pictured here white ankle socks, saddle shoes, and officers are reading hats. Um, as we can see from the wrens from Northern Ireland and across the world, they sit with their they sit within sit with their sisters from across the British Armed Forces and the British Commonwealth in their service within the various navies from Canada to Australia and India to South Africa. Many women of diverse backgrounds served in varying capacities in the wrens, wrens, swans, etc. Until relatively recently, little was known about the swans and the wrens, but recent academic work has been undertaken to highlight the important role that the swans, wrens, and other under-researched naval services played in World War II. Similarly, a project was recently undertaken to record stories of the last remaining members of the wrens who live in uh, England, Scotland, I think Wales, and India, and further afield. And that is both um, women from India and British Indian or British women living in India at the time of the war as well as collect photographs, letters, and other artifacts linked to the Wrens. By highlighting the wide variety of women serving in the Wrens, both in Northern Ireland and abroad, I hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit more about the Wrens and their worldwide contribution to World War II. By including different, but albeit similar stories, that these women wore similar uniforms and undertook similar duties, their individual stories add to the growing and more inclusive narrative of the role of women in World War II. It is worthwhile noting that nearly all of the British Commonwealth navies included some form, sorry, navies included some form of permanent and or voluntary REN service after the end of World War II due to the excellence of the women's service during the war. Before these servicing services being incorporated into the various navies in the late 20th century, it just goes to show that by freeing a man from the fleet, the women of the REN's not only freed themselves from pre-war constrictions and placed on them due to their gender, in class, they also paved the way for the permanent and voluntary rents of the post-war world and the eventuality of women being able to join the Royal Navy on the same basis as their male counterparts, truly inspirational women. And, and the, it's quite hard to find photographs of Wrens post-war here. Um, this is a Women's Royal Naval Reserve from Edinburgh. I'm presuming they wore the same uniform here, but you can note the um, uniform is slightly different, is that they're now wearing tights instead of stockings, which are more practical. And also they have the lovely beehive bouffant uh, hairstyles, which I think was very hard to keep your hat on. Mm -hmm. um, and they went right through until 1993 when they were incorporated into the Royal Navy. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rachel. Uh, that was a happy call. Uh, something I really embarrassingly little about. I'll be uh, happy enough to admit. Um, I think we've got enough time for some questions. Has anyone got any? Any questions out there? We've all stunned in silence. Yes. I'm actually, I too like to be much interested in that no one here for first world war organization and you know, about the active service death and everything like that. Uh, and the other 
they can just sort of the them that stick to the manager's levels. Mm -hmm. So I'm really fine with the building up. And I was interested because I was with the my friends that had two family members who were rents. Oh, well, one, amazing. One, one was never had and one was maybe at least one of the other services. Um, and there's only one ended up in Canada by a meeting with this, and one ended up in Bermuda. Oh, it's in the different swans, and I wonder, did once people were allowed to go abroad, then would women in Northern Ireland travel and end up in those rooms? Possibly. I haven't looked at as aspect of my research, and I might have to do that. But mm -hmm. yes, I know there was a post war migration scheme to all these places. So if they were in Rennes, maybe went to Australia, and they're like, well, hard to get, they would go in as a permanent mm -hmm. member as a job. And obviously, Rhodesia and Zimbabwe didn't have it because they're they, they probably, I think they had an army corps but not naval corps but yes they probably went to South it's Africa and Canada worked for another country as a yeah yeah you hear friends staying right on until the 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 permanent formation of the services or you do hear them migrating or maybe they've caught a year and haven't got work and they're coming back into it but I think they had to join straight they had to go back and do all the training again but i think there was a lot of conjecture that they shouldn't have to do it because some of them were like high ranking and they did go in but i think it depended on the circumstances as well the uh like we said a lot of recruits from another island from ireland when they recruited, did they tend to be kept within the areas they recruited, or did they get sent anywhere they needed? So when you filled out the form was mobile, ran, it depended on your age. So you had to get your parents' permission if you were under 21, um, or your husband's permission, <laughs> which most friends, because they were serving, didn't really care about and they meant anyway. But I think most, some, unless they were particularly young, like 17, 18, their parents wanted them to stay here, but I think a lot of them did let them go abroad. They could go abroad, or if this opportunity arose while well, they're still here and it was a good opportunity, they were allowed to go. But it really was at the behest of parents or husbands. So were, they, were they more often more likely to stay at home? I think they're in Northern Ireland, they're more likely to stay at home. But I know that from research, a few did fake signatures because they were they wanted to go abroad to some of your climbs, and a lot of them ended up staying in Hong Kong, Australia, Bermuda. Places like that. You sort of have answered the next question. Of the, the was no marriage bar. No, it wasn't a marriage bar. No, mm -hmm. unless they had children. But then, yeah, they would have probably have left anyway. But no, there was no marriage bar because the men would have been off for years serving anyway. So mm -hmm. yeah, no marriage bar. Mm -hmm. You tend to have the officers were more married women than the ratings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the average stage you come across? I think they can only join at 17. 17. 17 and a half, I'm sure. Yeah, they only Yeah, they that, yeah. 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 But I think it would, would have been quite obvious to find out someone was 15, 16. You know, it would have been, like, even though the First World War, it's 20 years, it's a thing that changed a lot. So, yeah. Can you tell us about Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> He, there's the I think he was approached to design it because there are a few of the other couture ads. I don't know who designed the ATS and the WAFs uniform, but I think they were designed by a, a Paris, well, British designer. But Edward Molyneux was based in Paris before the fall of France in 1940. But he has Irish connections, but I'm not too sure about them. But he, he did tailored suits, so they probably approached, you know, if they were doing tailoring to. And you did say you should have formed the other to the individual, right? Yeah, the many officers, yes. Probably. It's a, it's, I would have joined the Wrens just with the uniform alone. It's absolutely beautiful. Like, it's the, the it's the still the women's dress uniform for the Royal Navy now is that jacket, suit, and stockings are tights because it's the classic shape as well. Because I think the other uniforms were not very flattering, the, the big white belt, which is not very flattering for most women. Many just the uniform. Yes, the many. Many. Yeah, there was one Ren she joined as a rating, and it was the first time she had her own clothes because she had so many. She was the youngest in a load of like ten family of like girls, so she had her first everything, and she ended up marrying like a very high ranking officer, and she went to university off the floor. So a lot of them went in, and they had like an amazing life that they never would have had on the travel as well. So 
uh, their 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 horizons were broadened. It's interesting because you, men you mentioned that the, you know that in the in public there was the stigma if you were male to join any of the British Armed Services that stigma wasn't there for okay. female. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't stigma. They, they could come home and afterwards, and it was fine. Where obviously the men couldn't, so that stigma wasn't there. Particularly in the nursing service, but then there were so many Irish nurses pre-war, anyway. So, yeah. Do you think we could see any more political activism sparked by these women finding the outlets and breaking away from more traditional society? Do you think there's a possibility that is there any link to it? Is there any evidence for that? I know that there's definitely some. I, one I read recently, she it wasn't anything to do with the usual stuff that happens here, but she just the albums that she just hated fascism and she's like if nobody else i'm going to go join just because it she the way she said it was a transcendent her fight was transcending border so she wanted to go into her bit so that was obviously the only way she could do to join british armed services i haven't looked in to see if any of them went to canada or further afield i would like to look into that or the american services too it's obviously that's a huge irish american connection but she the yeah, they're very strong women. Yeah, particularly like you look at Dean Catherine first, they were all into like the suffrage movement, and then mm -hmm. they had the vote by the time the Second World War came around. But like they, they were literally pushing the vote out there to get more things for women. Thank you. Well, don't get away that quick. I got some last thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, that is the third of our series, and very good it was too. I'd enjoy that. Um, our next lecture is on Thursday, the twenty fifth of the April. Uh, uh, it will be uh by Alan Freeburn, uh, formerly of Dublin War Memorial and now uh, in the Patrick Museum, and it will be honouring the memory of the victims of the Blitz. Uh, uh and. If you want to see the further more details or sign up for that, please go to our website. So again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out very much. And thanks for watching. Hopefully we see you again. Thank you.